Welcome, as always, everybody, to the only place that you need to be, middle of the week. First half is dead. Weekend starts right now. As always, you turned into the Metal Summit. We are your Island of Misfit Toys. We've got Psycho Steve. We've got Bobby. we got Angel and I'm Jay. As always, we appreciate you guys tuning in with us. We're going to bring in our guests very, very shortly. A lot of you guys can see him already, and we can't hear, wait to hear what he has to say. But I'm actually going to kick it over to Psycho Steve for a couple of announcements. As you guys know, we've been... Uh, teasing poking prodding about a little bit of fun a really rad event that steve is working with so i'm actually going to kick it over to him steve it's all you man what do you got to tell us okay well thank you jay just want to let you guys and girls and everybody in between yours truly just steve for this event not psycho steve because this benefit is for youth mental health i happen to be fortunate and blessed to be the mc for this event it's june 5th and 6th in sunbury pennsylvania at the spyglass ridge winery with one of the very special guests being there is actually our guest tonight, Mr. Patrick Tennyson, uh, the Lita Ford Band. Uh, and so we have Lita Ford performing. We got Warrant. We have Winger, which is the whole original lineup with John Raw, um, because, you know, he's not an original member. Uh, you also have Eric Martin Band featuring Joey Casada of ZO2. He also played with the Jim Brewer Band. And, of course, you got Steve Brown from Tokyo Motor Fist, Trickster, and PJ Farley from Trickster, Ra, and now Fozzie. Um, who am I missing out? You also have Paulie Z's band called Bohemian uh, Rhapsody. You got New Jersey uh, Vocals Regional Band called Without Reason, Tommy Rice. Steve, and, real quick, Steve, real yeah. quick, buddy. Bohemian Queen. Yes. Bohemian Queen. Thank you. So I don't know who else is in the band besides Pauly, so we'll, we'll just see because I've never seen them before. Uh, so I want to give a pair of tickets to a, a metal summiter. I don't know who. So I want to make it interesting. Um, so next week we will give the tickets away because it's next week and it is the show. It's almost a full week away. Uh, so it's in Sunbury, PA. The tickets are only $89 a ticket. It's general admission. It's all ages, and it's for both days, uh, and it's on a winery, so you can, you know, drink and watch all these talented people and not so talented people, like I.E. me, uh, MC, and you know, have a good time. So I don't know what we should do to give it away. I just want to give a pair, just to pay it forward to uh, one lucky or two lucky summiters that will, you know, want to come. What should we do to give them away? Should we ask a trivia question? I don't know. What do you guys think? I think uh, I think we could have a, a little bit of fun with some trivia. I think we could actually have also a lot of fun with uh, maybe a little bit of a TMS history, you know, for the I people the that have, uh, that have way been riding have this wave with us for a little while. Yeah, the only way you could qualify besides answering the question correctly is you have to subscribe to all our channels, meaning Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. Jay, okay. we could also go, how many episodes was Bob Sober on? There, That's the question. <laughs> Nobody knows the answer to that. The question is, I got it. I have the question. All right, what episode did Bobby pass out like a fat kid in dodgeball? <laughs> that is the question. There we go. Okay. I like okay. it. So that's the question. So... I need an answer by next Wednesday, a week from tonight. Inbox us on Facebook.com backslash The Metal Summit. Um, and just, whoever just answers snap, it, uh, just, just snapshot us that you follow all the pages. Yes. And then you guys win a pair of tickets to the show. And just then let me know. And then I will put your, your name on the list for that show. So that's what I got to say. It's for youth mental health. Go to brownpapertickets.com. All ages, general admission, great cause, great talent. There's going to be a lot of food trucks there. There's going to be a couple of raffles. Um, if Patrick is so nice to sign a couple of guitars and the rest of this band and the other cool. bands, I'm going to be raffling off a couple of guitars. Sorry, it's not any arsenal like yours, Bobby or Jay. Um, they're really inexpensive guitars because I'm a single dad and I can't even pay attention. So uh, I just bought a little inexpensive. I bought a Squire. And I bought a little Ibanez 
just like I said, it's not meant to be played. It's more to be displayed. Of course. My whole thing is get it signed by everybody. You can get it signed by any of the Metal Summoner guys that are out there. You know, look. Right. Uh, and the other thing, Steve, not to butt in, but we do have a special guest introducing Winger before they go on, who is Tony Coelho, former congressman from California, author of the Americans with Disability Act. Tony would be happy to sign it if you're there. You get the guitar, bang. We'll do that on Sunday. There you go. Absolutely. Happy, so, to, have, that's what happy I got. to make those fans day. Exactly. So go ahead and introduce our guest, Mr. Oakley. Will you Absolutely. Please um, again, so super stoked to uh, to have this guy. I've gone back with uh, all kinds of different projects with him. I've uh, seen him many times with uh, Lita. Super duper stoked about everything that he does with Heaven Below. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Patrick. Mr. Patrick Kennison, thank you for joining us. Woo! Thanks for having me, guys. Hell yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> man. Well, the first thing is I really got to jump right into this because – you put it up on your social media. Bobby uh, Bobby Rocks put it up on his social media. You are slinging in rehearsals for live shows. Start right off with that, brother. How does that feel? Dude, it is so therapeutic, cathartic, all those fancy words. We don't even know what they mean. It's awesome. Lita shows up. People think, oh, this is legendary person. She is the ringleader of making us be like, holy shit, let's get out and kick ass. There's no whining over there. It's Lita shows up and says, okay, let's fucking go fuck everybody up now. People are tired of being on their couch. So she gave a speech before we started rehearsing that gave us goosebumps. And we cranked up and just been going at it for eight hours a day. Wow, man. Awesome, man, for sure. So, um, of course, people are going to be, you know, very very familiar with like a lot of fantastic songs her catalog the hits um you often duet with her when it comes to close your eyes forever her duet that she did famously with ozzy is there anything you can tell us about maybe a song or two on the set list that's maybe new or just something that you are now really hyped to just be rocking out on stage yeah, there's something really killer. I don't want to give too much away. We're not jumping into the new album just yet. Uh, she has such a back catalog. There is some Alice Cooper, Lita Ford related material that rears its head. And uh, I can say I get so excited when I play it. I have to check myself and say, OK, keep playing. Don't fuck up. Keep playing. Uh, <laughs> so I think people are going to get excited. It's a it's a flashback, but it feels new. Awesome, man. A hundred percent. That is super duper rad, Patrick, for sure. We're going to bring the boys in right away. Bobby Dreyer, I'm actually going to kick it down to you, man. Oh, okay. So a couple things. Uh, One, thank you. So you and I have a close relationship with a good friend, and I'm going to drop his name right now because I love Mr. F.U. Dash tone.com, Mr. Adam Reaper. Thank you, brother, for doing all this shit for us. But you keep Patrick rocking, you keep me rocking. But the other thing you and I have a connection is Bobby Rock played drums on my first two albums. Whoa! Yeah, so I recorded my first album, a lot of it, up at Neil Zaza's studio up in Akron. I've never met anybody dedicated, you know, working out at the gym with him. Just what a... Not just as a musician, but just what a dedicated person. So you mentioned about Lita. How's your relationship there with Bobby? Look, this guy is a powerhouse, not as a musician. Great, clean mind, clean body, you know, and that's the way it goes. So explain a little bit how that relationship came about. I got to tell you, when I went to go try out for I was excited to play with Lita. When I found out Bobby Rock was on drums, I'm a huge Vinnie Vincent fan from when I was a kid in elementary and middle school. To see Bobby Rock behind the kit, I was like, people like, were you nervous to play for Lita? No, I was nervous to play in front of Bobby (laughs) fucking Rock. 
And um, Bobby and I immediately connected. He's from Houston, Texas. I'm from yeah. San Antonio, Texas. So we had a lot of connections. But I already knew the powerhouse of Bobby Rock. So that's who I was auditioning for was Bobby Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that would have been yeah, the real deal. Me nervous too, dude, because I'm a big Nitro guy. Yeah. You, you figure between Nitro, he be, being in Vinnie Vincent, then with you know doing Nelson, Nelson with with Neil Zaza, he did, and then with he and the Buddha and Neil, the trio that they had together, and, and Neil, I got to give a shout out to Neil Zaza. Tremendous. When I heard you were coming on, I'm going, wow, what a great fucking band. I mean, the way yeah, lead us to shit. Yeah, when Bobby plays drums, I mean, there's no way you have to play badass. Uh, he's up there with people like Mike Portnoy, stuff like this. You know, he really is. Before people knew about Dream Theater and Mike, people knew about Bobby Rock. You know, it didn't matter if it was hair metal or whatever. The guy yeah. can play anything. An incredible musician, great band, and it's great you're going on. Now, one last question. Um, is Lita digging in? I, I know she's got an archive of shit, but does she pull any runaway stuff out? Absolutely. We got a couple of runaways tracks that, that come out once in a while. And uh, I mean, even at Soundcheck, I'll go into a, little, a couple little riffs and we start playing it. And, you know, sometimes they, they make it to the set. And so there is a couple old school hits from before some of us were born, you know? <laughs> hey, for sure. I was at the, I was at the part of my hair a few years ago, brother, and with, with Cherie right on the stage. Wow. That was definitely That's crazy. Cool. We're doing M3 again in July. Yes. Yeah, man, I will see you there, I'll be there for sure. Yeah, we are definitely excited for that. I think it's about time to bring in our ever beloved Jew for you. It's like, oh, Steve, let's hear from you. All right. So the question I had for you was I asked you, since you're a Texan and grew up in Texas, was about your influences. Did you start out as a rock and metal head or did you, like from your parents or your, any family members, influence you as far as in musicians in the family or? Yeah, right out of the gate. I'm the youngest of seven kids. I got a, I got a Hispanic mom and I had an Irish dad. So there was... No protected sex in that house, clearly. Uh, <laughs> I rolled out in the 70s, and I had six older brothers and sisters. I remember hearing Led Zeppelin, ACDC, um, Rush, uh, Cheap Trick, Kiss. Uh, I remember hearing Judas Priest in the late 70s when I was just out of diapers, and it was a no-brainer for me. I was like, this sounds awesome. My older brother played guitar. And I, I wasn't old enough to start smoking weed with them, but I did anyway. And uh, a guitar ended up in my hands and I just stayed on it. I didn't like sports. I didn't didn't get good grades. I didn't do theater. I wanted to play the opening riff to Highway to Hell. I wanted to play the opening riff to Hellbent for Leather. And my brother showed, um, the first song I ever learned was Breaking the Law. My brother showed me, da na 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 And I guess I, I mastered it for a, being a little kid, a 10-year-old kid. And so my mom got me a guitar, and that was it. I was off to the races. Do you still have the guitar? I don't. I don't have my first acoustic or my electric. Um, I, I remember my mom was excited that I was doing well with the guitar. So she said, oh, well, if you want to trade it in at the music store for one with the tremolo bar that you want, the little whammy, you know, you didn't even call it a whammy bar back then. Right. And my mom let me trade my first electric for a real Kramer with a real Floyd Rose. I don't have that either, but I just, I went on from there. Kramer Focus? It was a Focus. It was the Randy Rhodes one. Oh, wow. nice. Yeah. Because Vinnie Vincent was playing uh, a, a Jackson, and my mom said, I'm not spending $2,000 on a guitar. You can have that <laughs> other one, that one right there, the Kramer one. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you have a supportive family that, they at least bought you a guitar. Oh, there's no way I would have, I would have done anything if I didn't have that supportive family and, uh, you know, and I can't say the same for my friends. They pulled through without having supported families. So, you know, God bless anybody that does it without that love. Nice. Absolutely. So, 100%. Since you grew up in Texas also, 
Um, Jay, I'm just going to keep going, considering yeah. where we Bobby and Angel. Uh, yeah, good, buddy. There is quite a few, you know, like my very dearest friend, let him rest in peace, Daryl Abbott, for Dimebag Daryl and his brother. Um, did you guys ever cross paths? In the, Absolutely. In a- when I was in Union Underground, we were friends with Drowning Pool. God bless Dave Williams. Right. And um, I remember one of the Union Underground gigs on, uh, let me see, New Year's Eve 2001. The lineup was Union Underground, Seven Dust, uh, Gasoline, which was the Abbott Brothers yeah. cover band, and Drowning Pool headlining the Bronco Bowl in Dallas, Texas. One of the most memorable gigs ever. And um, I was a hu- I still am a huge Pantera fan. I saw them many times in the 90s. It was, uh, just talking about it is insane. I, it was the craziest, heaviest, tightest, most authentic metal ever. So those are fond memories. All that stuff. Just right. very fond memories. Yeah. He was one of a kind, and his playing was just, you know, no one could touch it. Look, there's other people that are more, like, fluid, like Pertucci, Five, you know, that, but... His way of playing, me personally, I'm not a guitarist. I am the least talented one out of everybody that's in the Metal Summit. Uh, I have the perfect face for a radio, but, you know, um, <laughs> his just his passion, you could feel it through his heart, and it went from his heart to his fingers and to his music. Absolutely. I remember being scared to talk to him, but I ended up with a black tooth in my hand. And uh, <laughs> uh, funny enough, Phil Anselmo was kind of my bro for the night when I'd hang out with, with, with Pantera. And that was, I guess, before he had some uh, uh, addictions and struggles. But those guys treated me like family. I guess, I don't know, they saw me hanging out with Drowning Pool and Jason McMaster from Dangerous Toys and people like that. They just were like, well, he's friends with them, so he's friends with us, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. Actually, hey, Patrick, since we were talking about guitars a little bit, let's kind of keep it on there as well. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Schechter because you've been with them for quite a minute now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was bound to happen. There's a there's a guy that works at Schechter named Scum. They call him Anthony. I'm sure you know him on social media. And he's friends with everybody from the guys in ministry to, to the guys in Fear Factory to me to whoever to Nikki. And he brought us in there in that company – it's, it's like what we're doing right now. It's guys sitting around. Well, I'm not going to say they're drinking, but they are. And uh, <laughs> they have fun doing what they're doing, talking about things like Pantera. And so you go hang out at, at the Schechter, at, at their offices. It's, it's not California bullshit at all. It feels like hanging out with your friends. And, it, you know, of course, the guitars are great. But the fact that it's family over there is really what, what – what makes me enjoy playing their guitars. The fact that they're great and it's it's friends you can drink with. Absolutely, for sure. So I'd asked this question on a couple of other previous uh, shows and uh, nobody could answer this question. But we talked about this off the air, so I know you can answer this question. I've got lots of guitars. Bobby has lots of guitars. I have guitars that I've given names to. I know that you do, too. So talk about some of your guitars and what you've named them. Okay, I got all kinds of... I got uh, some of them here. I got some in Lita's Locker. Um, I have a Blood Splatter V that people have seen. I call it Shark Week. Um, I have a uh, I have a Meigs BC Rich model um, that I just call Red. I have uh, one of the last guitars that Bernie... Rico, BC Rich himself made. I call it the Ferrari. I played it in Union Underground. I still have it. Um, I got a lot of fucking guitars, man. That's what happens, I guess. I don't know. I have a guitar that Robin Zander of Cheap Trick gave me right here. um, Signed to me. I cried on the way home because I wasn't expecting him to give me a guitar. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have a bass from Nikki Six over here. What I need now is a guitar from Lita Ford. And I always tell her, Lita... I have great celebrity given guitars. I'm ready for you to give me a warlock. So exactly. she hasn't given it to me yet though. Well just talk to Jim Cara, right? Doesn't Jim make her guitars now? Yeah, Jim Cara does stuff for her. And right. she still plays her old school BC Riches from the eighties. <laughs> 
Yeah. That's awesome, man, for sure. Yeah. No, definitely. When you talked about Meigs, as in Meigs from Coal Chamber? Meigs from Coal Chamber, my buddy. Yeah, he had a signature BC Rich. They made a very low amount of them. I have one right here. It's it's, it's a great guitar. Is that that, like, clear one that you can, like, No, see I have through? one of those also. I've got a clear one. No, I'll show you what it is. Yeah. This is rad. What? This is Meigs's nice bc rich next remember body that. one humbucker one volume one kill switch uh numbers on the inlays it weighs it feels like a les paul it, it, it plays and sounds crazy badass i don't take it on the road because it can't be replaced they don't make this yeah. anymore no totally yeah. dude that's awesome no i remember that guitar i love meigs i was a big coal chamber guy and i love Thank what you. he's doing right now with gemini syndrome so i'm really yes. really proud, proud of what he's doing with that for sure hell yeah he's one of my buddies we talk all the time still out here in uh in california that's awesome man for sure so before i kick it back up to steve you mentioned them a little bit um and since we were just talking about meigs i think that's kind of a cool segue and stuff Talk a little bit about Union Underground, because when you guys came out, that was really right around the time of that kind of industrial new metal thing, but not so much with the the rap as in new metal, but just that newer bands flooding of like early 2000s, late 90s metal bands. So talk a little bit about what was going on with them, because you weren't around for very long, if you don't mind me saying so, but you really did leave a mark in the metal world when it came to that. Yeah, it was a weird time. It was the end of the 90s. Bands like Stabbing Westward had hits. Static X was coming out. Uh, Disturbed came out. An unknown band called Linkin Park used to open for us and get booed by the audience. That's a good story. Uh, And... uh, even a band called Nickelback <laughs> opened for us. Uh, it was a weird but cool time. It was transitional. We were out of grunge. There was this post-industrial sound. We were putting drum machine loops going, and then I would, you know, tuning down, playing a seven string. It just felt cool. We weren't rapping or anything. And we got a record deal and we got out there and we made all the mistakes that you used to see on behind the music that all the bands do with money and drugs and all the bullshit. Um, And when it ended, I was like, you know what? I'm not going back to San Antonio to pretend that I'm uh, whoever. So I came out to L.A. and, and did what I did. But I learned a lot in that time. I learned fuck of a lot. I learned what to do, what not to do, where money comes from, who should put their hands in the money, who should be away from the money. And, wow. um, of course, we did all the cliche stuff, like I said. But, you know, from it came a lot of great things. John Moyer ended up in Disturbed. Yeah. You know, I ended up out here. I got to play on a, a Rob Zombie album, stuff like that. And I just... I don't know. So learning, you're always learning, I guess, you know, you never want to feel like you learned everything because you, you never do, you know, but yeah, we did. We got out there and said, let's, let's be, let's be a cross between Motley Crue and Pantera or whatever we were thinking while we were drunk and high at the time. (laughs) You definitely had that. You did have that kind of shorter but longish kind of reddish Nikki six generation swine thing going for a little while yeah yeah it just kind of worked I thought I thought well we sound pretty cool maybe we should look cool too (laughs) whatever our definition of cool was in 1999 2000 no totally brother well that that record you put that up on social media recently because didn't you just get that uh that Rob Zombie record recently for your contributions to not uh, too long ago, yeah, <laughs> probably well before COVID, probably a year or two ago, yeah. Gotcha. Nice, nice. And before I kick it up to Steve, um, there was, from my understanding, plans of you and the guys playing like a one-off Union Underground show with the whole record being played in its entirety that was squashed by COVID. If that's well, the case- that was the singer, the, uh, the singer of the band revamped it. I walked away from it. Moyer walked away oh. and he just kind of like an orgy, like what the orgy singer does. He decided he was going to do it. And that why well, I wasn't a part of that, but it, I, I guess it got squashed or they didn't do anything with it from what I heard. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, okay. No problem. Well, fans, yeah. stay with us. We're working right now to get Bobby and Angel back on. So it's myself and Steve rocking out with Patrick as that storm kind of swept through and put us into a, a little bit of Hurtsville. But we're still here and we appreciate all you wonderful metal summoners rocking out with us. So, Steve, let me kick it back up to you, my good sir. All right. So we mentioned a bunch of bands and everything. The question is, what was your first concert? My first concert was very, very important. It was Iron Maiden in Wasp, March 5th, 1985. I went to that. I was already into Wasp and uh, very much into Iron Maiden. I had no idea that concerts were like that. My mom would have let me go to concerts before that because she knew that, that everybody smoked weed. So, you know, she waited till I was 12. I guess when you're 12, you're allowed to smoke weed. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought a wasp shirt. I remember my mom gave me $20, which I, at the time I thought that was like a hundred dollars. My mom actually gave me $20. And, um, but most importantly, that was it. I, I, my brother still tells the story to this day. He says I was stone faced and my eyes didn't blink and I didn't say anything because I was just in awe of Blackie Lawless drinking blood from a skull playing I Want to Be Somebody. I was in awe of Aces High was the first song from Maiden. Eddie came out at the end. Uh, this Eddie walked around on stage. I'm like, what the fuck is this? I, it's, it was, that was it. I was, I, I'm off to the races after that. So 85, let me see. So who was in the band? That was um, Chris Holmes, of course. Blackie yep. Lawless. Randy uh, Piper was on guitar. I'm going to see Randy. And Steve no, Riley was already on drums and on the yeah. shirt. Yeah. Wow. So that was around Electric Circus era. No, no, no. That's the first. That's the first album. It, it was I Want to Be Somebody, Love Machine. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, yeah, because uh, Stephen Riley had left Keel because he just really was feeling this opportunity with Wasp. And I talked to Stephen not that long ago during. COVID and he he loved his time in Keel. There was just something about that visual and that wasp opportunity that he couldn't say no to. But yeah, that was a uh, that was Steven with Randy and Chris. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, and people were smoking a lot of weed at that show. I remember as a kid I was like, this smells like my older brothers and sisters room, only in a bigger <laughs> place. <laughs> did you Patrick, did you get hit with any of that flying meat? I didn't. Uh, my my seat wasn't close enough. I think I, I was in the mezzanine or something that they called it. But but I saw it. I saw all that shit. And I, I hung on every word that Blackie said and every word that Bruce Dickinson said in between every song. Oh, that's wild, man. For yeah. sure. Like, hmm. All right. Other question. Who are your friends outside the band like you hang out with since now that you're a Californian? Like, yeah, I hang, I, I hang out with a ton of musicians, of course, but you're talking about people I don't play with? Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, or in the music industry, but don't, you know, or they could be like a, like, a, like a rarity, like a celebrity. Like, for example, if you're friends with like Patrick Dempsey or something like that. Yeah, uh, well, that there's wonderful beer. people. Uh, D. Snyder moved near where I live, and we do shows with D. Snyder. I haven't run into him yet, but my roommate has, and I'm always like, Make sure to tell D that you live with me. You know, I tell my roommate that. And that's D Snyder is one of the smartest, most smart, rebellious guys. If you remember back when the PMRC in the 80s and all that. Yeah. He's one of yeah. those guys. When you hear him talk, you're like, oh, my God, that's what I want to be. I want to be that smart and that rebellious. I would be like him, but I'm not quite that smart. But I am that rebellious, damn it. Um <laughs> He's a great guy. I, I have a few actor friends. I have other guys, the guys in L.A. Guns, stuff like this, you know, Richard. the guys in Disturbed. I still talk to all those guys, you know. I see some of the Linkin Park guys out here, stuff like that. Now, you said L.A. Guns. Now, we have to – which one? Those oh. the L.A. Guns? Well, I, I'm friends with Tracy and Phil, but I am friends with Steve Riley also, so I guess I'm in the middle of everything. Gotcha. You're Switzerland. I am. Absolutely. Okay. To be honest, I, I kind of fall into that, too, because, like, I I mean, like, Steve has been very good to me over the years, 
Uh, same with Scotty Griffin from when he was with Steve and Phil. If they're falling on the same night, for example, honestly, I'm going to be at Phil and Tracy because I actually have a personal relationship with Ace and Johnny. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like I've only brushed up against Tracy and he's been nice to me, but I don't really have a relationship with him. Phil's always been nice to me, but I have a real relationship with Ace and Johnny. So that's where I, I land. If you're going to force me to take a side, I'm going to go Phil and Tracy because of my buddies, because of my close buddies. That's exactly where I'm at. I'm on the same boat as you. Same thing. I love, I love Steve and I'll always give him a hug. God bless him, and he is definitely a legend. But yeah, I'm with I'm with the boys also. Yeah, I'll give him props. He played with Steppenwolf. <laughs> I didn't even it. know that. There you go. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, the other question is: I'm a bit of a car enthusiast. What kind of car do you drive? I drive an SUV. I drive a Mitsubishi SUV, an Endeavor, because I can fit my guitars and any gear I need in it. <laughs> the older I get, the more I want a big vehicle. I don't want a small vehicle. <laughs> Maybe that's the Texas in me. Yeehaw. You know? Of course. <laughs> Wouldn't they call it suburban down in Texas? Like a um, something limo? Limousine? I don't know. I've been away too long, I guess. <laughs> all, right. all right. So another question is, uh, we all know you have a girlfriend. She's also a musician. Did you meet her at your show, or did she meet you at your show? No, your show? we didn't meet each other at, at either show. I remember we saw each other at NAMM, and we had mutual friends. And um, the Texans always end up talking to each other. And I thought, man, she's so hot. And then I saw her play, and I was like, gosh, she plays so badass, too. And we became friends first before we had anything uh, plutonic or whatever the fancy word is. And... Um, yeah, it was somebody that it's it's nice to, you know, marry your best friend or whatever all the things they say or be with your best friend. And and it just made sense. Right on. Yeah, that's, that's really, really cool for sure, man. Um, so, so we are live. We are getting people asking questions. Do you want to take a couple of them? Mr. Let's Wilson? take some questions. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Psycho. I was actually just reaching out to Angel. Be like, hey, guys, if you because um, our, our mates are still with us. They're just not on here. So I was like, guys, if you could hit me and Steve up with some questions, let's get Patrick some questions. Oh, yeah. All right. Do you want me to read off a couple? Yeah, go, go ahead, Steve. Rock it out. Okay. Well, of course, I would usually say, where's Matt? Porter, but he's here. <laughs> All right. So the question is, Matt wants to know, um, what is your favorite Lita Ford song? Great question. Excellent question. Um, one of my favorite Lita Ford songs now is Back to the Cave because her and I do a guitar duel oh. in it. And when I joined the band, she goes, she goes, we do Back to the Cave and you and I are going to guitar duel. And I'm like, what do you mean? You like, you're going to play and then I'm going to play, but during the song. So right now, my favorite song is Back to the Cave. Now, when I was a teenager, when I saw Lita Ford, when I was a kid, I might not have been a teenager. I'm, I, I might have been tw early teens. It was definitely falling in and out of love. I yeah. thought she looked so hot, and I knew Nikki Six wrote it, and I watched it on my parents' TV on Headbangers Ball. So falling in and out of love when I was a kid, Back to the Cave, now that I'm in her band. Oh my God! He said, "Back to the cave." That's so amazing, dude. I have to find. A, I have to find that vinyl before next Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Patrick, you and I will have to keep in touch better, like exchange some better information and stuff like that. Because I also have a, I've got the original, original then band cover of the Out for Blood vinyl that I've been yes. trying to show Lita and get her to sign. Just haven't been able to like cross paths with that. We're gonna but, make um, it happen. We'll make it happen. No, nah, no worries, bro. Absolutely, Steve. Keep rocking with it. Since we're talking about old hot lead, I had to bring that up because I loved that cover. But since you brought up the PMRC, it it kind of was appropriate to talk about that because it kind of got relieved by that. Absolutely. So another question I have. First of all, um, uh, Metal Summoner's birthday, a very special one that's been sticking out with us. For quite a while, she got turned on from when we had a band called Kick and Valentina on, a couple of members of them. 
Uh, Miss Kim Sullivan's birthday today, so none of us, all of us aren't on, but physically, I'm here, mentally, I'm over there. But I just wanted to wish her a happy birthday from all of us. Yeah. Here happy birthday, Kim. Happy yeah. birthday, girl. So, all right, you know, the question of the night and everything, besides guitar, what other instrument do you play? Who? I, I tool around, as uh, Pantera would say, I tool around on keyboards a little bit. I play keyboards on some of the Heaven Below stuff. I'm not great at it, though. I am not a multi-instrumentalist. I have people that produce our stuff and people in my band that are multi-instrumentalists. I am not. I do vocals and guitar. Those come pretty naturally. I'm a half-assed keyboard player. Um, when I play bass, though, I sound like your friend that plays guitar that goes on bass and shreds. That's what I sound like. And you're like, stop shredding. It's a bass, not a guitar. Um, so, I'm not an, I'm not a multi-instrumentalist. I'm just not. I, uh, you know, I work for to sound like I do on guitar and vocals. Um, but I can uh, I can bring a little bit of it to keyboards and piano. And um, just enough to record, not enough to go play a show where I'm on keyboards or piano all night. Gotcha. So you can't do a Yanni cover band. Is that what you're trying Ain't to say? Ain't happen. Okay. <laughs> nice. nice. All right. Now, also, the question is, for any of your family members, you said your brother played guitar, but how about, like, any other family member, like mom, dad, grandma, grandpa? Like, yeah, mom mom played piano. My dad played clarinet, not professionally, but they, they bust out some songs, no problem. Some of my older sisters would play piano and guitar. It was a musical household. I guess I was the first one that took it professional, whatever that word meant or means. Um, yeah, there was a little bit of that, and I heard that all the time. My mom would play piano, and I'd hear it, and I'd be like, how does she make that sound like that? You know, and uh, she did it for fun. It wasn't even her main instrument or her main thing at all. And my dad would play clarinet because he played in a band and he was he was definitely good enough to play a song. And they they weren't professional. But just hearing a person that, you know, play an instrument when you're a little kid is a big deal. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. No, definitely. <clears throat> um, Patrick, I actually see one from one of our fans, Candy Burton who would actually like to know, um, aside from music, what do you like to do in your spare time? It, it sounds cliche. I live near the beach. I love going to the fucking beach. Nice. Uh, Nikki and I go out there. I love to drink out there. Um, I, I'm mostly music, man. The, I, I try to do video games sometimes, but I'm getting older now, and I haven't put any time into it. It's music or nothing. Uh I'm not very good at anything else. I'm good at drinking and and making music. <laughs> nice. What's your true choice of drink? Right now, it's it's a it's this truly right here, which is like the White Claw wannabe. <laughs> but my my favorite drink, I love whiskey. I'm a gentleman Jack man. I know Jameson's good. There's all kinds of fancy whiskeys. Here's the problem when you go with real fancy alcohol. It, they don't have it everywhere you tour. So if you want to drink some fancy scotch that's 40 years old, you're not going to find it everywhere. But you can find Gentleman Jack a lot of places, and I think it's a lot better than Jack Daniels. Jack right. Daniels is drinkable, but only if you mix it with, like, ginger ale or something. Right. So Gentleman Jack is my jam. That's my jam. So that's on your rider for you? No, it's in my backpack just when I show up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Nice. <laughs> Um, and we talked a little bit about Dime, about the black tooth grin. I, I had many of those, and I did not like it. I guess it's like an acquired taste. He's like, come on. He, he used to call me his favorite Jew. Yeah. So he would just <laughs> hand it to me. He goes, well, come on. You're my favorite Jew. Come on, bro. Try it. Yeah. <laughs> and after a while, it just, like, grew on me like fungus or something. I'm just like, all right. I, I would never turn him down because, you know, it's insulting him. It's you like know? Jägermeister. Jägermeister isn't good, but we drink it. That's just what right. we do. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. Hey, Patrick, we got one, brother. Uh, Del Nickel. You've talked yeah. A lot about, you've talked about Cheap Trick. What is your favorite Cheap Trick song, and have you ever covered them? 
Oh, my God. Great question. My favorite cheap trick song is probably off of Heaven Tonight. It's a, it's a French word, off we de zay. I don't know if I, if I'm saying it right. Oh, I know Andrew, I'm saying. Off we de zay. That's That is heavy metal before people knew what heavy metal was. And Cheap Trick is a band. People think of Cheap Trick, they think of the flame and I want you to want me. That's totally misinterpreted. They have metal songs like Off We Is a metal song. That's my favorite one. Um, and, oh, man, I could say a hundred Cheap Trick things now, especially with Robin giving me his guitar. <laughs> I think Heaven Tonight is their best album. I almost named my original band Heaven Below, almost called it Heaven Tonight. But then I was like, it's not a tribute band, so I'm going to call it Heaven Below. That's awesome, man. I actually did one, when I saw that question, um, I actually did want to use it as a bridge because I thought I, I liked the fact that they asked, well, real quick, uh, the second part of that question was, have you ever covered Cheap Trick? I have, uh, just for like family members. I recorded a couple of them and I've never released them. I would, maybe I should get inside this computer and hard drive and release them. Uh, only privately I have never, never done cheap trick publicly. I played, I got on stage with cheap trick and played with them in Canada uh, oh, wow. a couple of years back. That was, that was really fun. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, bro. So I thought when I saw the, the question about covering, it was kind of like a perfect bridge because you've got three fantastic albums with heaven below, dude. Like I absolutely love what you do. It's fucking great. But most recently, you have rest in pieces. And I got to tell you, dude, like a stone is fucking bone chillingly amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like your vocals and your delivery of that song really, really rocked me, dude. And, you know, like I had said, dude, I followed you back to, to Union Underground and all that kind of stuff. But it was like, um, like not shocking as in a, well, of, of, I can't believe he was able to do that. It was just shockingly good, like, and touching when you released um, Like a Stone. So bringing kind of back to that record, because it is your most recent release, what was your thought process behind putting out a tribute album as opposed to an originals album currently with Heaven Below? Yeah, it it was, uh, here's what happened. We Heaven Below had covered a few cover songs like Major Tom, that 80s song, that nobody knows who the artist is. And um, it got over a million uh, uh, streams on just Spotify alone, not even all the other stuff. And we finally thought, well, we should do a whole cover album. And then I thought, let's do a cover album of bands that are gone. Well, so we'll do Pantera. Uh, we'll do like um, Black Sabbath is gone. Motley Crue is supposedly gone. But as we were thinking that, people started dying a lot. And I was like, wait a minute. Let's start paying tribute to our, our heroes that are gone, never mind if the band is around or not. And so it turned into, let's do We Will Rock You. Uh, let's do ACDC's Touch Too Much for Bon Scott. And, and of course, around that time, Chris Cornell passed. And I was like, oh, my God, there's only a gazillion Soundgarden songs that would be great. But I remember seeing him do Like a Stone Unplugged on AOL Sessions. And it moved me. It just it gave me goosebumps and everything. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try to kind of get some of that in there. It was hard because I'm such a fan. And uh, I finally thought, well, screw it. We'll light these candles, set up the mic. And if I have to play it 20 times to get it right, that's what I'm going to do. And that, it just kind of set the, 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 the course for that album, Rest in Pieces. And, and then it turned into, you know, a, a song for Chester and a, a song for the Ramones and everything. It just kind of, it, it kind of was obvious to us by that point. Once we recorded like a stone. Nice dude. Did it just make the most sense to you to kind of be the sole guy of that video and the performer? Was it just the, the best way to do that song? Yeah, because I knew we had uh we will rock you was already, the drum track was already recorded. I said, we're going to, we're going to do, we will rock you. We're going to do uh revolution is my name. And those are, punchy in your face so i need to go the other way for chris cornell and his song i need to i need to go strip it down all the way just me and the guitar nothing else and uh, i gotta tell you man it's daunting because when you play hard rock you got a badass drummer you got big sounding amps 
when it's an acoustic in your voice, there is no safety net beneath you. It has to, it has to work, you know? And um, I just kept doing it until I thought we had the take. Got you, man, for sure. Steve, let's kick it back up to you, man, with questions, of course, from yourself, or if there's any questions that you've seen from the fans you want to bring up, let's let's have them. Okay, so uh, Paul Bowman, sorry if I fucked up your name, bro. Um, Do you prefer, uh, wants to know, do you prefer writing to a metronome or other musicians in real time? It's funny, uh, definitely not a metronome. Um, I used to write to drum grooves, like the drummer of Aerosmith has a CD of him playing all these different grooves and different tempos. And man, I could always write a song to that. You turn the CD on and it sounds like John Bonham, but with whatever the and you, you can jam over it. And I wrote a lot of songs like that. Um, but with the Heaven Below stuff, it's a live drummer. I, I can sit with a drummer and go, Give me a groove that just, I'll put it on them. Give me a groove that makes you feel good. And, uh, you know, we crack open some drinks and get the amps loud. You're going to write a fucking song if a drummer is fucking kicking your ass. And uh, that's kind of what I do. It, it, it feels like I'm 13 again, so it must work. <laughs> right on. And to segue into the other question is because uh, Lita is coming out with a new album. Mm-hmm. Now, Lita, I believe, lives in Vegas. You live in Cali. Bobby lives in Cali. Yep. Other guys live in Cali as well. So and all did... the band, all the band, but Lita is in Los Angeles. Yeah. Oh, okay. So did she come to you, or did you guys go to her? Or um, no, you... she would bring Physical bring it. us out. And even as a matter of fact, right here in this room, I cut some of the backing vocals to her new album right here on this microphone that's covered up right now. Um, (laughs) Technology for recording, as you know, it is the CGI of movies. Now, we can record stuff in this room, and then as long as it's on the right tempo and stuff, we can put it into an album. It's, it's, I can't believe that I lived to see it go this way. You know, I started when I was, when I was a teenager, it was still reel to reel, you know, with 50,000 microphones. Cut it, slice it, tape it. Oh, we had guys splicing. I watched the Union Underground album was recorded right in the middle of all that. It was like analog's done. This is Pro Tools. This is dig- it was a, a, a amalgamation of everything. Yeah. Right. When I first started on radio, we did reel to reel recording and stuff like that. And I learned at college. I went to UConn and the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, and they're like, "Oh, you need to learn how to do that." So they're giving me a sharp object. I'm like. Uh, you realize I am Psycho Steve. You really want yeah. to get <laughs> Okay, here we go. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. I'm like all nervous and everything. They're like, all right, you just have to do a 60-second spot. And I'm like, can I just write it and just do one take? And they're like, you can't. I'm like, yeah, you can't. Come on, it's me. And they but still it gave use- you an appreciation. You have the appreciation like I do now. I'm like, holy shit. I yeah. can like, I have, I have something that can sound exactly like my Marshall stack, but maybe better. And it's right here. You're like, wow, oh, a JCA 800? I'm going to use that. And Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, nice. So, all right, here's another question. Uh, I never asked Lita this when I interviewed her, but I'm going to ask you. Um, before you, with Nikki and everything, was there any interest in dating Lita? Um, well, I'm just as guilty as you are of that same poster that was in your room. I think I had that same poster. But I got to tell you, when I got the Lita gig, the first vibe I got from her, it, uh, uh, the day I auditioned, which I put the audition video on my Facebook um, with her permission, I got the big sister vibe right away. And I was like, this is comfortable. She feels like my big sister that, that's toured the world and done all these legendary things you know right on so i i wouldn't even want to mess that up even if i did feel differently and um i just roll with that she's somebody i can text and and share stuff with like that with and nice. it's definitely the big sister vibe awesome nice yeah cool that's awesome for sure steve i'm actually going to jump in right quick man just to uh take us on to a, a quick little break because at this time of the uh, show patrick we always just thank a little bit of our sponsors and the uh, people that back um and um uh, 
prove and help us out with our show so we can keep bringing on artists like yourself to get to rock out with us every single week. Um, so for the record, with us having Patrick here, hey, Schechter Guitars. We got three guitar players on this show, four with Patrick. One of them happens to be a bass player, i.e. this guy. Um, talk to us. We we would love you. Anyway, we really appreciate all the, the people that get down with us for sure. So we always want to take, take a second to thank uh, Bradley, BLE, who's been putting on these fantastic shows, put on one this past Sunday that was absolutely fantastic, headlined by Kick and Valentina, and just released two upcoming shows that he's doing, one being headlined by Danger Danger's Ted Poley and the other one being headlined by Tantric with uh, Baltimore's own Silver Tongue as the direct support. So BLE, Brad, Angie, Dawn, thank you guys all so much for everything you do. We really appreciate you for sure. We always want to thank Mark and Janet from Rock and Horror Apparel. Um, thank you guys so much for everything that you do. Love your clothes. Absolutely fantastic. They do everything from clothes, vests, stage clothes, T-shirts, all kinds of fantastic stuff. They're TMS alumni. They had an absolutely epic episode with us, and we really definitely appreciate what they do as well. Saren from uh, Twisted Vines Horror Decor. Appreciate you as well, girl. You do absolutely fantastic work. She does all kinds of creepy, awesome stuff. Voodoo dolls, Ouija boards, stuff to hang on your wall. Super duper rad stuff. David Rosenfeld from Rosenfeld and Associates. NJSmile.com keeps those pearly whites of Psycho Steve Pearly. So we really appreciate him being involved. He's got a fantastic band, Tonal Crush. That's excellent, as, black as, as well as Black Rose Rebellion. So, David, we always appreciate having you involved. And we also want to thank John and Bubby's Beanery, bubbysbeanery.com, for everything that he does as well. I'm out of Tom's River, New Jersey. Fans, don't move. We're going to jump real quick to just a short little commercial, and we will be right back with more of your questions and more with Heavens Below's and Lita Ford's Patrick Kennison. Don't move. Thank you guys so much for all of our sponsors. Again, everybody that's involved with us that continues to make this show just totally rock out. As Again, we are here with Mr. Patrick Kennison, who is spending his fantastic evening with us. And thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Patrick, we're actually going to jump back a little bit into a couple quick questions again before I kick it back up to Steve. And our co-host, Angel, who we're trying to get back on but having a couple of weirdness with, he wants to know, when you go on the road, what's your go-to when it comes to guitars? You talked about some guitars that you will not take on the road because they're replaceable. What's in your arsenal for live shows? A lot of great Schecters. Um, of course, that custom purple Telecaster that everybody saw me post that they call the Seahawks or the Joker guitar. Um, that's my newest one. I'm taking that out. I have a lot. I got the uh, Shark Week, the Blood Splatter one. Um, sometimes I bust out this right here with Heaven Below. It's a seven-string Avenger. Wow. And then, and then so that it can really be 1996 crazy, the low seven-string has a, a hip shot to go down to drop A to go lower than corn. I do that with Heaven Below, uh, and it's just a workhorse guitar. I, I got a few of these Avengers, and this Schecter stuff, it just stays in tune, and it plays – it plays like a like a guitar that's much more expensive than it is. 
So that's what I stick with. I, I do a lot of that stuff. It's mostly these Schecters. And, you know, Nikki has her own um, uh, her own signature model guitar. And we just it's easy for us to play that stuff. It plays great. It sounds good. And they're down the street from us. How can we say no? <laughs> <laughs> now, is it Schecter pickups in it as well? No, I go on on most of my Schecters. They vary. I, I I'm back to where I started. I'm on the Demarzio pickups. Those are the the ones from the '80s that like Ace Freely and like George Lynch used back in the day. I'm I'm back on those for the most part. I'm not a huge active guy. I have an eight string Schecter over here that has EMGs, and there's nothing wrong with those. I feel like if I'm on a passive pickup, I can hear the guitar. I feel like if it's an active pickup, I hear the pickup more, you know, so I'm not a purist by any means, but the DiMarzios make me feel like I'm a teenager again, so I'm kind of staying on those for right now. Right on. What gauge string do you use? Um, my strings are almost always light top, heavy bottom, so I, I'm on the 10s on my lead stuff, but the low is like a 52, so it's like 11s on the low stuff. The reason I do that, not that I'm a lumberjack, but I can be heavy handed sometimes and I don't want the strings to go sharp when I dig in. So mostly I'm on 10 to 52, light top, heavy bottom, kind of like okay. a Zach Wild. I think I have Zach Wild and people do stuff like that. Nice. And how about picks? Medium, heavy? Um, pretty heavy, not insanely heavy, probably like 0.96. Um, you know what's funny is I can acclimate, as long as it's not super thin or super thick, I can acclimate to most picks you hand me. Um, as long as they're not those little jazz picks like a lot of my friends use. I know Nikki yeah. uses them, and those are great for shredding. Uh, I usually can I can use about anything between 76 and 96. I don't like extremes. I don't like a floppy pick, and I don't like a super-duper 2.0 or anything. Yeah, I, I tend to lean towards like regular mediums, but when I'm playing bass, I prefer them to be heavy because I don't want the pick. Uh, when I'm playing my bass, like I prefer to be bass picks because I'm a little clumsy, so I kind of need that bigger pick to hold on to. Yeah. But I also like them to be heavy because, you know, with those thicker strings, like I want that kind of boom you get by hitting them with a pick that's not overly flexy and stuff like that yeah if, it, if it's floppy it feels like the pick's trying to keep up with your fingers you don't want that you want it thick enough to where if i play fast it's it's moving as fast as i tell it to yeah for sure and i totally understand what you mean about the jazz picks brother because i'm a huge michelangelo badio fan and he yeah. you that's what he uses but of course with what he does of course he uses those tiny little things but I always, it always kind of jokingly blew my mind because I'm like, God, you're, it's like you're trying to play like your guitar with like a tooth. Like, how are you even holding on to it? I would, my, my fingers would be bloody if I tried to use a jazz pick. When I, when I do the opening of whatever song, I would probably cut my fingers. It has to be a regular size pick for me, not, not a small one. You know, and that being said, people like Jeff Loomis are kick ass on picks like that. You know, yeah, dude. Tucci's the same way. He yeah. Uses Bitty bitty pick, and I'm just like, what? Ow. Yeah, totally. You can, so it's amazing. You can acclimate to a lot of things if you just. I could probably use a quarter if I had to. It might take me a week to get used to it. <laughs> For sure. And since Steve kind of brought up the picks and everything, um, you you love putting your various different picks up on social medias with your pick packs and all that stuff. For the fans that are going to be coming out and seeing you um in the in the coming weeks, are you are your picks still currently those? variation of colors with like the pearl like the green the pink the blue with like I the think I, have, I think i have them around here somewhere yeah i got all the different lita picks and if you go to her mer merch booth i have a whole pack of all the different colored ones that i've done with lita oh nice because the ones that i see have your signature on one side and like the uh the typical black widow lita hourglass on the front yep yep absolutely i'm coming up with some new picks that are i call it my hometown zero pack it's going to be out soon. It's all the places you can eat in South Texas, but instead of saying Taco Cabana, it's their logo with my name. So it's the <laughs> Alamo, but it has my name. So I'm, I'm making packs for people that are that are South Texas or Texas people. So that's my next endeavor. Nice, dude. So I got to ask when it comes to Texas, uh, San Antonio Spurs fan? Absolutely. 
But I, I'm, I'm a traitor because I'm a big Lakers fan, too. We watched – Nikki and I watched the Lakers nap last night whoop some ass on Phoenix. So <laughs> I guess – I guess I'm be- I'm best of both. I'm a trader on each side. Nice, dude. That's awesome. And and since like um, I just think it, uh, it's kind of like I think it's kind of cool and and just kind of an interesting thing with you being with Schechter. Well, so is Nikki. When you had met her, was she already with Schechter as well? She was, was she already with Schechter. And I even played one of her guitars, and I was like, this thing feels amazing. Fuck Ibanez. This thing plays like a real guitar. I don't mean to diss Ibanez, but. It, this isn't a toy. This guitar has weight, and I can shred, and I can dig in. And it was one of the things that led me over there, absolutely. Oh, so she was with Schechter first. Absolutely, yep. Already had her signature model and everything. Nice, dude. That's awesome. Psycho Steve, kicked up to you, brother. All right, you ready? Here's the question. You ready? Okay. Stars at night are big and bright. Okay. Deep in the heart of Texas. That's right. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right, just making sure. That's I was just remembering that in Pee Wee Herman's movie. I know. I took a picture in front of my, my childhood home, and it's right. this awesome big house that looks like the Alamo. And somebody said, is your bike still in the basement? I was like, yeah, got me. I went to my childhood home the other a couple weeks ago. Right on. <laughs> my pa- whoever my parents sold it to probably should have shot me for being in the yard doing a photo shoot, but they didn't. Thank God. Nice. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here we go. If you were going to make a super group, you playing guitar or singing or both, who would it be in the band with you? Rob Halford would be the vocalist. Okay, so vocals. I'm the other guitar player. Okay, who else? Wolf Hoffman is the other guitar player from Accept. Wow, okay. Yeah, let's see. Who's on bass? Who is on bass? Bass is Jason Newstead for sure. Nice. Yep. Okay. And let me see. The drummer, I guess the drummer would have to be Bobby Rock still. That's who the drummer <laughs> would be. <laughs> no, he... We yeah. would be scary good. We'd be scary good, I think. That's awesome. Nice. Steve, keep, Steve, keep rolling with it. But uh, real quick, Jason, in, uh, sorry, Patrick, in, um, in Lita's band, you guys still have Marty, right? Absolutely. Marty's our man, yeah. Awesome, man. Right on. Steve, keep rolling, brother. I just was curious. All right. So uh, the question is, since we did bring up Jason, his name has come up a little bit in the news as far as in the whole Dave Elveson scandal, everything like that. Um, Who do you think would be a good fit to join Megadeth? I know that James Lomenzo was on base in the 90s, if I remember correctly, or before... Before Dave Elson came back, I know he did a great job. I would love for it to be Jason Newstead. Um, is it maybe it's too controversial? I'm not sure. I don't know. I know a lot of great guys that could be in there. Um, I just, I, I just, it's hard to imagine them without Dave Ellison. So I don't know. And there's so much controversy around it. It's like, how do you fill those shoes without everybody saying? Oh, you're the guy that didn't get in trouble, or I don't know. It yeah. gets emotional, which is part of the problem, I guess. <laughs> totally get it. Yeah. yeah. Now, pre-COVID and everything, you guys were supposed to go out. It was supposed to be Lita Ford, H. Freely, and Alice Cooper. Yep. Right. Yep. Now, Alice just announced his tour is Alice Cooper and H. Freely for the first leg of the tour, and you guys are doing dates. By yourselves, and then of course you're doing the the show that I'm emceeing, uh, and then there's a couple other shows that you guys are doing with other bands and stuff like that. Do we foresee or anything signed with George? Because George is still managing. Lita. Yeah, yeah, George is still doing it. To my knowledge, the the Alice Lita thing is not off the table. Um, okay. I don't know that it's going to happen in 2022. It's it's a Live Nation thing, as far as I understand. Okay. So I guess, you know, scheduling these things is weird because once a tour goes away because of COVID, as soon as things are back, people start putting plugging dates in right. to yeah. stuff. So it hasn't gone away. Um, and Alice tours a lot. So it's not going to surprise me if 22, still you still see Lita and Alice happen. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I saw when Lita uh, – I'm sorry, it was uh, – 
Alice, what are they called? Motions and motions and white. Motionless. Yeah, okay. that sounds right. And yep. uh, I'm thinking who else? It was. Hailstorm. Oh, Hailstorm. Yeah, and it was yep. Like, I remember oh, that. Great tour, you know. So. Hell yeah, we toured with Hailstorm, and they. I, I'm like a lot of people. I only hear the Hailstorm songs on the radio. I was surprised that they're fucking badass, kickass. Once we got out there and I saw them, and I'm like, oh, this is what it's about. You know, the radio's a, a great thing, but it's it misrepresents so many bands. Can you imagine? Oh, yeah. Oh, Metallica, the band that does Enter Sandman and Fade to Black. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. True. <laughs> yeah, because I heard a couple tunes via the radio of Hailstorm. And yeah. so I was like, oh, you got to check them out. I'm like, okay. So, and then I went to that show, and I was just like, totally like blown away. Yeah. With the whole yep. band. Musician yep. wise, her stage presence, and, and she looks like she's having fun. So, you know, and that's what it's all about is having fun and, you know. The radio's been fooling us since we were little kids. We thought sure. that it was rock and roll all night. I mean, that's not even our, anywhere near the best kiss song. A hundred percent. And, you know, it's funny, Patrick, like when you were talking about the dates coming back in, because while I'm sure this is an unpopular opinion for most, including myself with them being my favorite band for 30 years, um, with all the tours kicking up, I wasn't rooting for it, but I'll admit I didn't hate when they moved Motley's tour again to 2022, simply because what I was worried about happening, which isn't exactly a bad thing, because like you, because it's your profession, like me and Steve, because it's our life, like, I want music to come back in full force as quick as possible. But right. it's exactly what I expected. It, all of a sudden, it was a tour, tours, tours, all this kind of stuff. So with that Motley tour, I was like, I'll admit, I don't hate that it got bumped to next year. Because not only do I have the show I was planning to go to, now I've got time to um, put to put some thought into maybe multiple shows. Because that lineup is so great. And our sponsor, Brad, who I mentioned, he and I are very, very close. And he and I had talked about, dude, now that we have like a year to look at this, we should put some thought into maybe going to some places we've never been to see shows. He and I are talking about San Francisco. He and I are talking about like Dallas. We're talking about a few things like that. But so I know that my not enthusiasm at the expense of sounding like a dick but my like, okay, because all these tours popped on, this big one I really want to go to now no longer clashes with everything. But it's definitely exciting, though, that like music is back to happening. So when you guys were all posting your rehearsal space pictures, knowing in my territory, because M3 is only 30 minutes from my house, um, and you've got Steve's event, that I was like, music, it's a thing again. Oh, I know. It was weird. I, I was I had to ask our guitar tech at Lita Ford. I'm like, how do how, where does this plug into to do what? I'm like, it's confusing. And I'm like, I'm just glad to be out there, man. Dude, to hear my guitar so loud that my balls vibrated. <laughs> I, you couldn't tell in the picture, but I can vibrate my balls again. This yeah. is awesome. You know, that, that apparently yeah, that's that's that. what makes us feel alive. So, yeah, I get oh, it. Yeah. Hey, dude, if you if you and Nikki ever get bored at home, do you just guitar duel at home? We we wake up sometimes and one of us jumps on an acoustic, which is how we ended up with all those acoustic couch jams. And somebody's one of us is making coffee. The other one's already playing Aces High unplugged. I'm like, that's a weird song to play unplugged. And then by noon, we have an arrangement on that song, you know. So, yeah, it, it, it is. It's a it's a it's a cool vibe. I, I I didn't know that would happen. I guess life has other plans. No, yeah. absolutely, man, 100%. But no, that, that's a good thing, man. There's nothing whatsoever wrong with that, dude. I mean, and that's that's a lucky blessing, man, because not everybody, you know, lands a connection like, like that. Not only, like, you know, as a, as a home, as a couple vibe, but also with you guys professionally. I mean, that's cool, dude. It's cool. We like the same movies. I, I think it's our first relationship where both people like the same movies. That's oh. a big deal. We watched <laughs> The Joker last night and we're like, 
God, this is such a fucking dark movie. It's so kick ass, you know. <laughs> That'd be a huge thing for me, dude, because I'm a core, a horror, just lunatic, man. So yeah. if, if I, if I, you know, am, am lucky like that, that I, again, I can score a horror fan, then I can't say that that's a bad thing, brother. Absolutely. The Texans always end up, uh, end up together, loving tacos, horror movies, and great music. I don't know. Maybe there's something in the water in Texas. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. The stars at night are big and bright here in the movies. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, Psycho, yeah. it's back up to you, my good dude. What was the first song that you learned on guitar? It was Breaking the Law. My older brother showed me Breaking the Law from Judas Priest. My second was Red Hot or Breaking the Chains. It was either Cruz Red Hot or Dawkins Breaking the Chains. And I learned the solos on that. I remember. I remember we're not going to take it. I could play the solo on that when I was a kid. Wow. Yeah. That's freaking rad. Yeah. All right. So let me see if any metal summoners has any more questions. Yeah, man. And once again, everybody, thank you for putting up with uh, our half-assed show due to the weather. You know, Angel and Bobby have been trying very diligently to log on sometimes you know technology could be your best friend or your worst enemy so everybody thank you for sticking it out with just jay and me and yeah of and, the man. and, and patrick this is this is not a representation brother but we really hope you're still having a good time because we love talking to you man hell yeah thank you for having me of course i love it no, definitely while psycho's taking a look at some fan questions just to see if we've got any i got one for you Four of the members of this show are also tattooed like you are. What's your first one? My first tattoo is is this one right here. It's kind of alien looking. It's yeah. kind of a, a skeleton thing. Uh, my buddy had this tattoo, and we shared the same birthday and played in the band together um, at the uh, right for Union Underground. And uh, I said, I said, man, are you an Aliens fan? He's like, oh, mega Aliens fan. He goes, I even designed a tattoo that looks like, uh, you know, the movie Aliens. I was like, wow, that's so cool. And then a week later, he's like, I can't play on May 17th. It's my birthday. I said, me neither. It's my birthday. And um, I always bugged him about that tattoo. And he finally gave me the artwork and I got it. So that was my first one right there. Nice. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's awesome, brother, for sure. Any plans to uh to fill up your arms a little bit, or are you just I want to. Them? I'll be honest, you guys. Never mind the fact that COVID crushed so many things. Tattoos are expensive as fuck, especially if you live in L.A. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> if I was in Texas, I, my arms would have been filled already. No, I definitely want to. I definitely want to do more, and uh, I have a hundred ideas that need to happen. So I. That's going to be my thing. New, live music is back, and Patrick's going to be tattooed more. <laughs> nice. That's awesome, man. You, you you should set something up with, like, Lita, where it's like, come on, let's just go do something. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty, I think that'll probably happen. Nice. She's pretty inked up, too, right? Yeah. She is. She's got some really like, cool stuff on there all the way down. I, I haven't gone to my forearms yet, but but I'm, I'm going to join the ranks with you guys. It's coming. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, she, yeah, she's got the big uh, widow's uh, yeah, the widow thing. Widow hourglass, right? Big and pronounced on her arm. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Yeah, dude, for sure. Steve, anything uh, jump up for the fans? Uh, it's a little quiet, uh, but the question I have for you, dream tour. Like, who would you like to go on tour with, with Lita that, yeah, like you would be direct support with? I'm a I'm a I'm a mega Judas Priest fan. Mega first heavy metal band I remember when I was about seven was Judas Priest. I want to tour with Judas Priest. I want to see that happen. Um, I know there's been talk about it before between industry people, and um, if I can open for Judas Priest, you can count me as a happy man in his grave. Um, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I've talked to the guys from Accept before i'm friends with them and i said it makes it only makes sense that lita and accept to do a tour together whether it's european or or over here in the states and wolf hoffman agreed so now i just gotta get everybody else to agree so i'm trying to work any any angle i have 
I will text Mark Tornello after the show, and I'll see. Oh, what I we love him. Talk about somebody that stepped up and made a, a legendary band stay legendary. Yeah, well, dude. The crazy thing is, he's a Jersey boy. I eat yep. him. So am I. TT Quick. Uh, yeah. So he started in the eighties with that band TT Quick. Then did a, did nothing. Became a union electrician. Yep. You know, uh, his wife is incredible. If they're watching, Hi, Mark. Hi, love Jerry. that. He just became a grandfather too, which is great. Yes. Yeah. You know? um, because I talk to his uh, stepdaughter all the time. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's just crazy. And then one day, uh, Joey DeMeo, not from uh, not from um, Man of War, another yeah. producer named Joey yeah. DeMeo uh, yeah. from Jersey. He actually produced, uh, he owns a, a recording studio, Shoreline. He recorded yep. one of Skid Row's albums. Yeah. And he invited Mark down, and Wolf was there, and they were like, oh, we want to jam? And they did a couple tunes, and then a couple minutes later, they did the rock star thing. So you want the gig then? Oh, man. And, and then they put out Blood of the Nations, and people like me are like, oh, my God, this is for yeah. real, and it sounds amazing. Right. Yeah. And they're like... Udo who? Yeah. We love Udo. Udo, yeah, Udo's definitely legendary in his own right. Uh, absolutely. Right. But Mark has been able to carry the flag. And uh, we're playing with Accepted M3, Lita Ford and Accept on two different days, and the Iron Maidens. Yep. So I'm going to have to watch my alcohol intake because I want to see all bands. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I'll, I'll keep that in mind, Patrick. If I happen to be a... Uh, walking by you a few times, seeing a different drink every time in my hand to give you a little nudge and be like, hey, dude, don't forget that Accept is on in two hours. I'll throw some water in there. I'll put some <laughs> water and find some tacos or something. So so here, here's, a, here's a fun question for you to kind of to kind of see maybe where your head would be at with different things. So with Glenn Tipton's recent, you know, retirement, for lack of a better term, from Priest, was there ever – thought in your mind to reach out to their camp or had the camp called, what would have been your reaction to maybe fill that spot? That would have been a weird thing because I really, uh, it, playing with Lita is definitely, definitely family. And if my favorite band of all time were to reach out to me, I guess the first thing I would say is, well, I'm not British. I'm pretty redneck. So <laughs> I still say y'all, I don't know. Could I fit in with those British guys? I mean, Scott Travis is American. Um, that might be too much. I don't know. I know all the songs. It, right now, you can name almost anything off most Judas Priest albums, and I could probably play you the intro and parts of the solo. Um, I don't know. The universe might explode if that happened. I got you, bro. <laughs> so, and the one I'm going to throw at you just for my own personal love, because, God, I love that song. Can you, If, if you are able to, can you play me Heads Are Gonna Roll? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I don't have anything plugged in, but yeah. I'll play it in between one of Lita's songs at M3 for you. I believe you will do that. That would be amazing, <laughs> dude. And all of a sudden, I would just be standing out there, and then I would just suddenly start going nuts, and everybody would be looking at me like, what the fuck? I'd be like, you're not a fan of my – if you're not a fan of my show, then you wouldn't know. Lita would look at me like, we don't play that song. What are you doing? Yeah. I'd be like, I'm just jam – I'd be like, sis, I'm just jamming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, no, that, that, that's awesome, man, for sure, definitely. Steve, let me kick it back up to you, brother. So, speaking of, there's also KK's new band, right, with Ripper. Yep. Uh, have you heard it? I heard it. I, I even pre-ordered the album at five minutes after midnight when they put the pre-order up. I did. Nice. <laughs> nice. And I was just about to ask, what are your thoughts about it? Well, I read KK's book. I read Rob's book. We all know that KK Downing put together Judas Priest back in the day. We know right. that KK had is why Rob and Glenn got in Judas Priest. So yes. when a lot of people get angry about KK calling it KK's Priest, you have to remember there's legitimate entitlement there um, right. for him to want to use that name. Um, I say I don't give a fuck what the name is. Uh, it's K.K. Downing, I'm going to give it a chance. It's Ripper Owens. I'm going to give it a chance. And I, I was impressed with the song. Um, what I will be more impressed with, is it a full tour? 
Is it something long going? Is it a toe in the water or is it diving in like except with Mark? Is it for real? Um, so that's what I'm waiting to find out. I know the Internet has people passing judgment. I can't pass judgment. I need to see a live show. I need to see a tour. I need to go to the merch booth and see the merch, everything. Yeah. Um, the, the, the jury's not out on that yet. Um, it sounds classic. It sounds heavy. It sounds like Priest. Let's see if it's fixed. That's what I say. Funny thing about Priest, when Halper left the band and they brought in um, Ripper, Ripper. Yep. years yep. ago, uh, there was a tour. It was like the Rock Never Stops tour. It was yeah. LA Guns, Firehouse, Doc. I went to that. T- I, w- I went and hung out with LA Guns on their bus on that tour. I yeah, so, so did I. So I'm, And this is when Adam Hamilton was playing with them. That's my boy from Texas. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, and, and Tracy was in the band still. Yeah. And Tracy and Steve and Phil were making nice. Uh, and it was right around the album Waking the Dead. Yep. So yep. around 2002, I believe it was. So I'm side stage. I'm watching, I think it was Dokken. And I was just like, and Barry Sparks was playing bass. Yep. And this guy, Alex Della Rosa, I think his name is, an Italian dude. Was Alex playing... Sacrossi? Yes. Yes. Yep. He was playing guitar. He's from Italy. And yep. he had a very thick accent and everything. And I'm just watching the show. And this dude with like a, like a baseball hat was just standing next to me and we're just bullshit, and I had no clue who it was, and I'm like, great show, right? He's like, yeah, and Don was pretty on point, you know, and then, and I'm just like, yeah, uh, and he's like, yeah, I hope I sound that great, and I go on, I'm like, and I'm sorry, who are you? He's like, oh, uh, I'm Tim Ripper Owens. I'm like, oh, I didn't recognize him, because he had a hat on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he wasn't in his stage gear or whatever, and I'm like, what's yeah. up, Ripper Psycho Steve? He's like, good to meet you, Psycho. I'm like, break a leg. And I'm like, no, this yeah, I didn't recognize you. And, yeah, he just sounded freaking just awesome. That night, unfortunately, though, Janie Lane did not have a good night, though, because apparently his inner, inner ronders were all fucked up. So he was just like, at the end of, you know, he says, oh, it must be magic. At the end of uh, I Saw Red, wow. he takes him out, and he's like, oh, my inner, inner, and what did he say, inner monitors, oh, it must be tragic. And he like oh, wow. and had a little hissy fit, you know, whatever. But yeah, so but yeah, I was quite impressed with KK and everything. I read his book and I interviewed him as well. And he was just he's just like so humble, you know, and just so chill. I brought up pre- because he was he still lives abroad, you know, yeah. he's still in England. So when Jason and I co-interviewed him and everything, and I had one of my very dear friends, who's a huge priest fan, um, come on. Um, course with cell phones if you call over there they're going to charge you like it's like a nine one nine hundred number yeah two dollars a minute so i bought a prepaid calling card yeah. you know and then um he said he was going to call us back and everything and i'm like uh what would you like me to call you do i call you mr downing kk and he was yeah. just like well you can call me mr downing but you also call me never call me late for dinner and he was like so <laughs> primitive you know and he was just like really you know, so really cool. But who else is, I don't even know who else is in this band besides Ripper and KK. Like, is there anybody else do you know that? It's it's you know? it's people from other metal bands that I'm not familiar with. I know Les, Les Binks isn't on all the tracks. He's kind of maybe on call or something. Okay. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. I know that their bass player's name is Tony. And that actually is something I just learned because... Like we talked about recently with uh, with David's situation, David played with Ripper and KK at some shows. I remember. So yeah, people brought that up as a possibility, and Tim messaged on like Twitter or something. He's like, "Hey, we have a bass player. His name is Tony." So they they have a guy, um, and that's and that's his name. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing I I know as far as the lineup goes, and. As one thing that might be kind of a cool tour idea, if you want to do something not necessarily intimate because the bands are still too big for it to be too intimate, but if you look at just regular type theaters like Ramshead Live in Baltimore or like the TLA in like Philly, is 
How cool would it be to see KK's priest with um, British Lion? Hey, that is a good idea. Absolutely. How, how cool would that be? I was like, you got a guy from Maiden and a guy from Priest not in the same band, but with their own respective, like, semi-smaller metal bands, I think that would be pretty rad. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. And we got one more thing for you, Patrick, if you don't mind, and it is, what, if anything, can you tell us about the upcoming Lita album? It's kind of conceptual. Um, that doesn't mean songs are long and weird. It, it, it means it has focus. And um, just when I heard the demos from it, it's got some guest appearances. I, I told Lita, I says, this is the album that you need to, to bring into now. It makes a lot of sense. It doesn't have a Kiss Me Deadly. Uh, it does have some stuff that's kind of like uh, Close Your Eyes Forever. It's got, it's dark. It's dark, but it's not weird. It, it, it's very, it's very immediate when you hear it. And um, I've only heard a few of the rough mixes, and it's definitely has all the key players that make it what it is. Um, and I think people are going to like it a lot. I think it's going to be cool. Nice, brothers. And with sh with shows like M3 and shows like what Steve's emceeing with his, re uh, with his show and all those type of bands, those sets do tend to be tailored very much towards the hits, because they tend to be smaller hits for, I mean, sorry, smaller sets for those type of crowds. But mm -hmm. with upcoming shows and headlining shows, are there any new songs that you guys are planning to play? Or, or do you still need to put a little bit of time before that? Well, no, we're right in the thick of it right now. We are breaking out a few things that aren't expected. You know, when you, when you have somebody like Lita Ford, there's a huge catalog to choose from. Yeah. So she bounces it off of us. Well, what should we do? What should we maybe not do? Um, but we're bringing it. We're gonna we're gonna throw a few surprises in there. It it is not a generic set by any means. It's definitely awesome. it's definitely for diehard people as well. Awesome, brother. Well, Patrick, we can't thank you enough, man, for spending some time with us this evening and having a really great interview. It was really enlightening. We had a great time. Our big thing is how you felt. Did you have a good time? Did you enjoy your questions? And did you feel that your time was respected? Absolutely. I love I love that you guys have the same knowledge that I have. And first and foremost, I'm a fan of music. I learned how to play Breaking the Law because I loved the song, you know, when I was a little kid in the early 80s. So it's 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 the same thing. I just I just so happened to, to get to play with my idols and get to do some other stuff, you know, so Absolutely. the love is mutual. Yeah. For sure, man. Well, thank yeah. you guys so much. Metal Summoners, we love you. Thanks for rocking with us through the little technical glitches. Don't worry, Angel and Bobby, they just went and took an extended bathroom break. They'll be back with us next week. Don't <laughs> even sweat it. But, dude, between myself and Steve, with his show and M3, Patrick, we can't wait to see you, man, and uh, have a drink with you and uh, and get to, to bullshit a little bit more with you. But we also definitely have to give an extended thank you and love out to our executive producer, Jason Perlzweig. Did a fantastic job. Fans, we weren't expecting that, but hey, it's rock and roll. It's not supposed to be perfect. And he really got us dialed back in. So we really appreciate everything that Jason does behind the scenes and getting involved with us as well. But again, for Patrick Kennison, thank you so much, brother. And for the rest of the Metal Summit, we got Psycho Steve for Angel, for Bobby. I'm Jay. We will see you guys next week. Guest announcement is on Friday. Stay tuned for that. Again, before I log it off, Psycho, what's that question? What do they have to answer to win those tickets? Yes, what episode did Bobby pass out like a fat kid in dodgeball to win the tickets to see Patrick and Lita and all the other great freaking talented people, excluding me, because like I said, I have no talent, um, at the Spyglass Winery. If you don't win the tickets, you can still buy them on brownpapertickets.com. Tickets are $89. It's for youth mental health. Come out and show some support and some love. Um, hopefully, I don't know anybody's doing any meet and greets, but I'm sure Pat will just jump off stage and, you know, sign some babies and shake some hands and yeah. take some pictures, stuff like that. And Pat, text me if you need anything because I'm coming out on Friday. So um, if you need anything because i can run to the grocery store or something pick you out some gentleman's jack or whatever yeah! uh, <laughs> Thank you. you know 
And that's oh, it. Yeah. And let's so, all have a good time. Absolutely. It's summer. Get out there. Music is back, everybody. So exactly. hit us up with the answer to that question. But don't forget, guys, we need proof of following us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. So make sure that you guys follow those. Show us that proof. But also, not only smash our um, socials, like the YouTube, like the Facebook, because that's where you're going to see these live. Make sure you're hitting up Patrick's socials, his socials on Instagram, on Facebook, the Lita Ford socials, so that you can see when he's on tour, as well as Heaven Below. So again, Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Jason Perlswag for keeping us rocked out. For On behalf of the Metal Summit, Psycho Steve, for Bobby, for Angel, I'm Jay. Guest announcement on Friday. We will see you guys next Wednesday. As always, as always, as always, you guys have been watching the Metal Summit. Dun, dun, dun.